All right, Ape students, it has come to this, the final video lecture of 2020. This is going to finish up Unit 4. Uh, we made it to the exact spot that I thought we would make it to. I wanted to get through uh, the first four units before holiday break, and we are going to be able to do it. So this is the final thing that we kind of have to learn. So, oops. all right, let's get into this. Uh, ocean currents and ENZO. You may not have ever heard of ENZO. Maybe you have, but we will talk about it towards the end uh, of this lecture today. So I want to briefly uh, just quickly review uh, a slide that I, I gave you in the last um, video lecture. And we were talking about climate and some of the things that uh, kind of impact and drive our climates. Uh, we talked about the Earth's orbit uh, around the sun on a tilted axis. You know, that does impact climate, okay? But that's kind of a, it's kind of a constant thing. I mean, the Earth is going to rotate around the sun, and it's always going to be on that 23.5 degree axis. Um, but because it does that, we have different seasons, right? So you know, there's seasonal change, and that affects climate. Uh, unequal heating of the earth by the sun. You know, again, we talked about this yesterday or the day before, that not every area on our planet receives the same intensity of sunlight. Uh, atmospheric convection currents, this is just a big fancy um, term for air currents. We talked about those convection currents like uh, Hadley cells and feral cells uh, the other day, polar cells. Uh, the rotation of the earth. Right, we talked about the Coriolis effect and the rotation. Now, the one that we haven't talked about yet is ocean currents. Ocean currents actually do impact climate. So we're going to kind of focus in on this one today. The other four we've already talked about, so you can go back to those lectures uh, and look those up if you need to. All right, so let's talk a little, a little bit about the ocean and, and, and ocean currents and uh, I want you to understand that, you know, I, I'm not going to talk a lot about this today, but um, I mean, you can take entire courses, you know, on oceanography. You can learn a lot more about currents. I'm just going to kind of give you some of the basics. Today. So, you know, ocean water circulates the globe, and it circulates very slowly. Now, <clears throat> with the understanding that, you know, different areas on our globe you receive different amounts of sunlight. You know, some ocean water is warmer, some ocean water is colder. You know, that's true at the surface. It's also true you know, throughout the entire um, you know, volume of water that makes up the ocean, you know, vertically and also kind of horizontally. So this has a big impact on climate, has a big impact on you know, biotic factors like living things. So one thing to kind of remember is that warm water tends to rise, cold water tends to sink. So that's kind of similar to air. We talked about that yesterday. Uh, but ocean currents, I mean, there's so many things that can influence them. You know, temperature influence, the flow of a current, gravity, winds, like we talked about surface winds. We'll talk more about those again today. Things like trade winds and you know, the, the easterlies and westerlies, all that type of stuff, that all impacts ocean currents as well. Um, Coriolis effect, you know, the spin of the earth, salinity, you know, how salty the water is impacts how well it travels, uh, and also if it rises or sinks. And finally, we have these giant land masses in the middle of the water, you know, that's going to impact uh, the flow of currents as well. So, a lot of factors impact ocean currents. So we're not going to talk about how all these things have impacts on them, but they all do. I think you kind of get the idea, hopefully. Uh, there's a couple of vocab terms I want to cover real quick. Uh, this is called a gyre. Gyres are large patterns of water circulation. Okay, for example, in this picture here, uh, you kind of see, you know, this is the, the Pacific Ocean, right? Here's your equator. And we've got this large circulatory pattern of water flow you know, in the northern part of the Pacific Ocean. 
We also have one down here in the southern part of the Pacific Ocean. Right? We've got one in the Indian Ocean. You've got one in the South Atlantic, in the North Atlantic. So if you look at those patterns, those are gyres. They're just these gigantic, kind of almost circulatory patterns of water flow, okay? In the Northern Hemisphere, they move sort of in a clockwise fashion, kind of see that, where is in the Southern Hemisphere, they move more in a counterclockwise fashion, you can see that as well. Now, one thing that I want you to understand about gyres is because they're so large, you know, they cover a lot of water, uh, they help to redistribute water in the ocean. You know, for example, I mean, just looking, looking at the North American gyre here, okay? Like, for example, this arrow here, right, is traveling along the equator, right? We would probably think that that water would be really warm, but then it kind of moves up sort of the western coast of Asia. By that water is still really warm, but think about what happens as it moves northward. Now, that water is going to start getting colder, right? And as it does, it's going to sink. So, you know, kind of along the, I'm sorry, this, sorry, this is the eastern coast of Asia. Uh, along the western coast of North America, that water is going to kind of go down, kind of sink and get much colder. So we have this, this flow of water, you know, warm and then cold, warm and then cold. So, it, it, again, it kind of helps to move, you know, that water and circulate that water all around the northern Pacific Ocean and, and every ocean for that matter. Now, one thing I want you to know from this picture, which I think is kind of interesting, you can pick any continent. Let's just start here with North America, okay? If you look at the western coast of the continent, like here's the western coast right here, right? You'll notice that there's a blue arrow there. You know, pick, uh, I don't know, Australia, right? The western coast of Australia, blue arrow. South America, right? Western coast, right? We see this blue arrow. The blue arrow represents a colder flow of water, okay? I'm not saying the water's like freezing, but it's a colder flow on the western sides of these continents. On the eastern sides, you see a warmer flow, okay? So just remember that. That, that, actually, is, that actually has a pretty big impact on climate. All right, now here's another term, it's called an upwelling. An upwelling is a kind of a vertical movement of water, kind of an upward movement of water. Here's a really good picture of it right here. So here we have like the coast, you know, it can be anywhere. But here we have the ocean kind of leading up to the coast, kind of an inlet area here. And you'll notice that there's wind, you know, just kind of blowing off the surface. I mean, this happens all the time. But that wind travels across the water as well, right? That's a surface wind. So that wind, not only does it blow in this direction, but it also pushes water in that direction. So when this water at the surface is blowing in this direction, the water from below the surface is going to move up and replace it. That's what an upwelling is. Now, why upwellings are important is because the water at the bottom of the ocean is extremely nutrient rich. There's a lot of decomposition down there. There's a lot of nutrients down there. And when that wind blows that water along the surface, all of those nutrients make their way towards the surface. And that's food for fish, right? I mean, you're going to have fish populations that explode all because all those nutrients are making their way uh, to, to, to the top levels of the water. So that's what an upwelling is. Okay? It's just kind of a vertical movement uh, of water from the bottom to the top. Okay? All right, this is called a rain shadow. A rain shadow is... Um, kind of, th this happens a lot on the western coasts of the United States. Um, a really good example is the state of Washington. 
if you're not too, I'm going to, I'm going to fast forward a little bit. I'm going to come back to that slide. This is the state of Washington here, right? This is all Pacific coast over here. You know, Pacific ocean is out here. But um, one thing, if you're not familiar with the state of Washington, there is a large mountain range that goes right through the middle of the state. It's called the Cascade Mountains. Okay. So I want you to think about all that wind that might be blowing in from the Pacific coast. Right? I'm going to go back to this real quick. Let's go back to this picture. So let's say this is the Cascade Mountains. Okay, and you've got that warm air blowing in from the Pacific. And we know that warm air rises, right? Well, I mean, not only does, is it going to rise naturally, but you know, it's going to move up this mountain. When it moves up the mountain, that warmer air is going to cool. So when it cools, all of that moisture that's in the water is going to come down as rain. Now, this is what we call the windward side of the rain shadow. The rain shadow is this whole area here. Okay, so you're going to get, you know, kind of on the the windward side of the of the rain shadow, you're going to get a lot of precipitation, a lot of wet, humid, uh, somewhat cooler weather. Um, think about Seattle. Like Seattle, Washington gets a lot of uh, of that type of weather. Now. On the other side of the mountain, which we call the leeward side, you know, the wind is going to continue to blow down the mountain, but it's lost all of its moisture. So this side of the mountain is going to genuinely be a little bit drier, usually a little bit warmer. Um, it's almost like desert-like conditions. I mean, again, if you look at this, look at this picture. You know, on the on the, again on the on the windward side of the mountains, look at all this green. I mean, this is like almost, you know, like tropical rainforest. In fact, it's it's temperate rainforest. Uh, but over here on the right, you've got almost like desert-like conditions. Uh, that's all because of that mountain there. Um, this is the this is Hawaii. This is Oahu, the big island on, uh, on Oahu. Right here in the middle, you've got this large volcano, okay? Um, and if you'll notice on this side, it's very green. Right on the other side, kind of dry, but again, that's because the winds blow this way along, along the Pacific Ocean, right? And they blow up the mountain, and it leaves this rain shadow on this side of the mountain, and then on the other side, it's much drier on that side of the mountain. So, you know, this white here is this is this cloud cover that you're seeing there, but but again, you know, we can see the rain shadow here, almost an kind of a flipped view of what we see in Washington, but we see the same type of, of uh, effect. All right, now the final thing here today I want to cover is something called ENSO. It's also known as the El Nino Southern Oscillation. Maybe you've heard of El Nino before. We're going to talk about that a little bit today. So a little bit about uh, ENSO. Let me move myself over here real quick. So you got to know a little bit of geography here. Okay, ENSO is an event. And it's kind of a regular thing. It happens every three to seven years. And it occurs in this little box here. So I want us to be familiar with where this is geographically. And here's your equator line here, right? Um, so it kind of happens between two continents, right? It happens between Australia, a little bit of Southeast Asia up here in the corner, like the Philippines and places like that are over here, you know, Indonesia, whatever. And then over here on the right, you've got South America. So this is where the Enzo happens. Now, I want you also to think about the word oscillate. When you think about something that's oscillating, think about like a teeter-totter. Right? It oscillates back and forth. So there's something happening in this box that is kind of oscillating back and forth. And I'll explain what that is on the next couple of slides. All right, so I want to show you here a picture of this area between South America and Australia, right? This is the Pacific Ocean, right? Blue, all this water that's there, okay? Now, before I'm going to go back real quick to this slide, the equator here, I want you to notice again, is sort of at the top of this box. Now, we talked about something in the last lecture 
that kind of occurs along uh, the equator. And that's the trade winds, right? The trade winds blow along the surface of the equator and they blow to the east. I should correct you, they blow to the west, right? From South America and they're blowing towards Australia. Now, because of those trade winds, what we end up getting is a lot of that surface water, which is warmer water, it's at the equator, so it's warmer water. That water you know, tends to blow naturally towards Australia. Now, because of that, because all, all that warmer water that's blowing that way, we get a lot of moisture, a lot of precipitation on sort of the western side uh, of the Pacific Ocean. You know, all because those trade winds are blowing that warm water and that warm water carries all that moisture. So we see a lot of precipitation sort of in this area, okay? Now, as that warm water moves, okay, it's naturally going to kind of form this sort of circulatory pattern. Okay. So we get this, you know, water moving over to the western coast, and then it's kind of sinking when it hits the coast. Then it kind of, when it sinks, it's going to, you know, it's going to become much colder. But that water is going to circulate back, and it's going to eventually rise up because, again, there's warmer water over here. So that water is going to heat, and it's going to rise. So what we're going to see on the coast of South America is an up we get a lot of nutrient-rich water that comes up over here. You know, if you're a fisherman, you love the, the western coast of South America because there's that upwelling that happens and there's a lot of healthy fish populations uh, over here on this side, okay? So this is kind of what normally occurs. Now, remember the teeter-totter, okay? Now, occasionally we get trade winds that weaken. They're not as strong, okay? This, this happens you know, every few years, every like three to seven years or five to seven years or something. So when this happens, we call it an El Nino. Now I want us to think about if those trade winds weaken, that means that that warmer water is not gonna push as much towards Australia. So instead of it, you know, kind of moving over there, a lot of it accumulates over here. So look at the position of our cloud. Now that cloud is going to be where most of the warm water accumulates. And if it's accumulating over here, that cloud is going to follow it. So that means that the upwelling that we normally would get is not there. Okay. So we don't have as much of the, that nutrient-rich water coming up. Now, this, this El Nino causes some major climate changes in the two continents. All right, in Australia, it becomes much drier, almost like drought-like. Like there's like no rain for like months. All right, that's not good because of the, the rain cloud is not over there anymore, right? It's now over here. So in South America, we get just the opposite. You know, we get these wetter, almost flood-like conditions, which can be problematic for people who live in South America. Now, the flip side of this is what we call La Nina. La Nina is the opposite. So instead of weaker trade winds, we get these stronger trade winds. So look at the movement of our, now our cloud is like literally over the continent of Australia. So we get a lot of that warmer water that moves over here. All right, it's gonna force an even greater upwelling. So we get like a massive upwelling during La Nina years. And again, we see these conditions that sort of flip. All right, I mean, if you look at the, at the El Nino slide and you look at this slide, they're just the opposite. All right, so think of the teeter-totter, okay? When it's, you know, to one side, it's El Nino. If it's in the middle, it's normal. 
But if it's on the other side, it's La Nina. So we're getting this oscillation back and forth, okay? But at some point, it's going to be down. At some point, it's going to be up. It just depends. It takes like seven years for the whole thing to kind of cycle through, okay? So here we have a picture of, again, kind of your normal conditions. Like normally, the warmer water would be over here on the coast of Australia. If it was a La Nina year, it would be, there would be a lot of warmer water over there. But the cooler water would be off the coast of, of South America. If we have an El Nino, where the trade winds are weaker, right, the warmer water builds up over here along the coast of South America, and the cooler water is over here uh, near Australia. So again, kind of the teeter-totter, the kind of the flip-flop there. All right, so here's kind of a summary of La Nina and El Nino. All right, La Nina, trade winds blow warm, warm air along the equator, but they're blowing kind of strong. All right, cooler water you get off of South America, you get an increased upwelling off the coast of South America as well. An El Nino is just the opposite. All right, so I always tell kids, if you memorize one or the other, just remember the, the other one's the opposite. All right, so we do have to know these conditions, like what's causing them to happen. But if you know one of them, then you kind of automatically know the other one. So I don't just kind of remember that. Now, another thing, just the last thing here, you know, a lot of times it, whenever we hear about El Ninos and La Ninas, you know, all, like, we, we, we don't really care about like fishermen in South America or what's going, on, what's going on in Australia. Most of the time we think about like, how is this impacting us? How does it impact North America? More specifically, how does it impact the Midwest? Well, in an El Nino winter, all right, during an El Nino year, take a look at this map. All right, we tend to get much warmer weather in Canada and the kind of the upper regions of the U.S. We also get much drier weather in the Midwest. So think about that. Dry weather means no precipitation. So in, a, in an El Nino year, we're not going to get a lot of snow and it's probably going to be a little bit warmer than usual. So think about like, you know, this year, you know, I don't know, it's December, you know, has it have we gotten a lot of snow? Has it been relatively warm compared to years past? I'll let you think about that for a minute. But then we have the opposite, right? This is a La Nina winter. This is the other side of the, of the teeter-totter. So in a La Nina winter, we get much colder uh, regions in Canada and the northern U.S., and in the Midwest, it gets much wetter, which means more precipitation. So we would probably predict that in a La Nina winter, we probably would be hit with a lot more precipitation, which could mean a lot more snow. All right, but again, sometimes it's neither one of those, right? So it's kind of unpredictable what we're gonna get. But if we, if we know it's a La Nina, we can kind of predict what it's gonna be like. If we know that it's an El Nino, probably predict what it's going to be like. But if it's in the middle, you know, we don't really know what we're going to get sometimes. All right. So make sure we kind of understand that about North America, especially where we live uh, during either El Nino's or La Nina's. All right, guys, that is it for me. Uh, enjoy your holiday break. Make sure you check your agenda so you know what's going on the rest of the week. All right. Have a good day, everybody.